Welcome to the Fall 2018 Innovator Story Series, Episode 1. I'm John Greathouse, and you can follow me on Twitter, at John Greathouse. I want to thank Pay Junction for um, sponsoring tonight's event. Pay Junction was founded in 2000, um, and it really turned the payment processing industry on its head by being extremely transparent with its customers and having a customer-centric, uh, people-friendly um, culture. Pay Junction is not only a great uh, technology company, they're a great place to work. Glassdoor recently voted them one of the best places in America to work. So they're doing right by their customers and they're doing right by their employees. And we thank them for sponsoring tonight's talk. We have tonight with us Al Ferrer. Al is the president and CEO of Linea Consulting, which is a major league baseball interpreter service. They also provide research analysis and interpretation of advanced Sabre metrics. We're gonna talk a little bit about Sabre metrics. His clients have included the Los Angeles Dodgers, almost the Dodgers jersey right there, um, the Angels, uh, and the New York Yankees. Al earned his graduate degree from Stanford North. I think most of you are familiar with Stanford North. Sometimes it's referred to as Chico State. Um, that was a laugh line. We're going to edit this, and we're going to make you guys, we're going to have a, a, a segment where you laugh really hard. Um, there we go. So he got his master's degree before he began his 31-year coaching career. I was especially proud of what his players have accomplished um, on and off the field. He had about 100 players sign professional contracts. About 23 of those players ended up playing professional uh, baseball in the major leagues. Uh, his four trips to the NCAA finals um, culminated in, in his induction excuse me, into the University of California Athletic Hall of Fame. And he retired with the winningest percentage of any UCSB baseball coach, either before or since. So Al had an incredible coaching career, but he also was a professor for many, many years. He's still a professor emeritus. Uh, and it, in his role as a professor, he developed and implemented UCSB's highly successful sports management program. So that was when sports management was just coming into its own. It was an emerging industry. Uh, and Al grabbed that and, as an innovator, sort of brought it into um, our university. Over a thousand students have been placed in professional collegiate front office positions as well as internships directly as a result to, um, of Al's efforts. He's been active in his retirement. He's making a major Hollywood motion picture, which we're going to talk about. It's great fun. I think you guys will enjoy hearing about that. Um, and he's also, I think, just as importantly, um, a wonderful uh, family man. He's been married to his sweetheart um, for many decades. He has three sons who I've gotten to know and um, they actually like to spend time with their dad. He has a whole gaggle of grandchildren that he hangs out with. And I think it's really important for young people to realize that you can be, you can achieve at the top of your game, division one sports, if that's, your, if that's your aspiration. You can win at that level, but you don't have to sacrifice your personal success at the same time. And Al's proof that you can bring those two together and really have what I consider the ultimate success, which is personally and professionally. Let's welcome Al to UCSB. So in case you're wondering, it's not that I don't like Al. Um, I would normally have given him a really warm hug, but I'm on, I'm on six different kinds of cold medicine right now. And I'm having an out-of-body experience. I don't even know what I'm saying right now. No, I'm just I'm finding a bit of a cold. I, I don't want to share it. So thank you for coming, Al. Really My pleasure. It. Glad to be here. So I want to jump right in and talk about a book that you wrote. So you're not here to promote a book. We're not selling the book in the lobby, but you wrote a book and it was for three very special people in your life. I'd like you to tell us a little bit about why you wrote that book and what are some of these specific words of advice that, that you would share with, with, I know that was an intimate book, but what are some things you can share publicly from that book? Well, why would he ask a question about a book that I wrote for three people in an entrepreneurial class? I used to start out my lectures with, theory is, and then I had a few former students planted or former baseball players, and they would yell out, crap. Everybody else would be stunned. Theory What's isn't crap. There's a place for theory. And you're getting theory in every class you have. What we taught was pragmatic. We tried to get you ready for what's really going to happen. Uh, you could be as successful as you want in the business world. And the last day you look at the mirror, the last day here, life's a failure. So you need to know the pragmatic part of it. And when I found out that we were expecting a child, I was nervous. 
I wanted to be a good father. I wanted to have a great relationship. And if I failed at that, I didn't know how I could be successful in anything else. I don't have a lot of ground rules. I didn't know what I was doing. <clears throat> it turned out being phenomenal. They're my best friends as men, uh, along with my wife. We've had varied careers, uh, various levels of success. But those relationships have remained now. They're three professionals. Uh, one's in your money world, where you hope to be. Uh, one is a professor of biology. And one played professional baseball and is now working in virtual reality with Major League Baseball. But they come home and it's a hug and a kiss, which is an Italian thing. But the relationship is there. Without that relationship, those, there would be no success. So when I was driving down, I was actually the passenger down the 101 in my son's pickup, my youngest son. He was going to start his first day at Pepperdine and we were going to help him move in. He was the third son to go there and play baseball there. And I was being real reflective. It was in one moment in time, you're sitting there and you're going, this is it. They're gone. And all the way through, I thought about them as infants and all the steps of the way. So what I did is I wrote a book, about 170 pages. Eight of them are reflect, eight chapters are reflecting on our lives and how it worked out. And the last two, I gave a survey at the end of every class. And if this were my class, I'd say, I'd like all the guys to stick around after class. Nothing against the women, but I was never blessed with daughters. I would hand out a survey of 10 questions. They would rate the relationship with their father from 1 to 10, why they thought that relationship was what it was, how the father treated the mother, was religion involved, time spent, and I get these answers. Well, I realized it was a skewed survey because you have to be fairly successful to get here. And you were probably in a pretty good environment for the most part. So then I had a friend from Major League Baseball who married a lady that ran a prison. And I got all the males in there to fill out the same forms. And then we compared and contrasted. So eight of them were father to son, experiential, and two chapters were statistical. That's, so three copies, one for Ty, one for Rye, one for Sai, and then I had another player that I became very close to that had some challenges and I gave him a copy, so that was it. Have you ever thought about publishing parts of it, maybe the, the parts at the end that, that, that talk about fatherhood and relationships? You know, I have thought about it. Uh, pretty involved in a lot of things. The book is now been out there a good 10 years. They all have children, by the way. I have five grandchildren by them. And they refer to it once in a while, which makes me feel good that they would be able to carry it on. Once again, that's the mentor thing that I'll talk about a little bit. None of you are that special, and I'm not that special. Well, the, I, I am. well you are. The way you motivate people to applaud is ridiculous. <laughs> but yes, you are. Um, we're going to make the same mistakes all the people that have gone before us have. That we're not, but if we have a mentor, that's like a guide in the jungle. We can avoid all those things. And I felt if I could help them not make some of the mistakes I made or maybe some of the things that worked, it would make it easier for them. That was the reason. Good. Well, we're going to talk about mentorship in a second here. But before we get to that, I, uh, I like a lot of things about your career. I like the way you started, co you decided you wanted to coach, and so you started high school baseball. And so, a lot of, um, you know, a lot, everyone, I, I'm, I put myself in this boat. Sometimes we want to go right to the top, right? We don't want to, we don't want to pay our dues or work our way up. We think we're ready. Um, and so your career was really t more typical where you took a stepping stone approach. So you're, you're coaching high school baseball. You realize it's something you really like. What, what, what do you, I don't know if you can remember, like when did you decide division one was your goal? And I'd love for you to share with the students a little bit about the sacrifices that you and your family had to make for you to, to achieve that. I mean, that's the top of your profession. Not many people get there. Uh, if you could just elaborate a little bit on that. Well, I wanted to go as far as I could. I wanted to see how good or bad I was, and you got to do that in the big arena. And uh, for eight years, which is a long time, it's a long time in this career process, I coached at two high schools, and we won everything in sight. It wasn't like I was a genius, but I was committed to this game and learning everything I could like a biologist would in their field. The people I was coaching against were English teachers that got the assignment of the baseball team. Mm. 
So it was almost not fair. All of a sudden, one day, I applied for a job at Fresno State. They had an opening. And I was in Northern California. We were winning. They should have known about me. I didn't even get a, a, a rejection letter. And I was ticked. And I came home that day, and I was really down. And I don't get down. My glass is 97.3% full. <laughs> That's how I live a life. And my wife said to me, what's the matter? And I said, well, I'm never going to get a college job. And she said, well, what should we do? What should you do if you want to do it? And I said, well, I should either find a way to get to the Arizona State coach or the USC coach and try and get a graduate assistant. I leave my job. You leave your job. We leave this house we built. We leave your family up here in Northern California. We go for it. Bless her. She said, let's do it. She was a stud. Let's do it. So I made some contacts, which I'm going to talk about later, networking. And I got an interview with the coach at Arizona State, and he brought me in. They were number one in the nation. And now my resume, we're going to talk about that a little bit too. My resume said Corning High School, Willows High School, Arizona State. You're building it. And that was a big move. Spent a year there. We had a lot of success. My mentor was the head coach. We became very good friends. He suddenly was at the top of my reference list, and it led to my college career. So I want to talk a little bit about mentoring. You mentioned the Arizona State coach. Um, I wonder, were there other mentors along the way or even after that? But also I'd like you to touch upon um, what, what can a student, what can a younger person do to be a good mentee to – to, to someone who wants to be the mentor but is busy. So I don't know if you can fold all of that into a response. But No, we talked about it a little bit with that group that I was with earlier. Right now, and I know I'm, I, I've done this so many years, I know how many hands are going up. This is rhetorical. That means if you went to Chico State, don't raise your hand. That's what rhetorical means. How many of you have a mentor? Wait a minute, you raised your stinking hand. I said, don't raise your hand. I'm kidding you. You're okay. Let's have them raise their hand. How many of you have a mentor outside of your family? Outside of your family. It's a pretty good start. But even within your family, that's the first place you look. Yeah, but that's too easy. I'm no, wondering. it's not too easy. This guy's smart. He's not that smart. Okay. <laughs> so uh, the first place you look, I feel, is your parents. And maybe you go 0 for 2. Careers. I had a mentor as a father. Not my father. I had a mentor that I thought, I'd like to be a father like that guy. I had a mentor as a husband. Now, that guy's a great husband. I had a mentor as a baseball person. Arizona State was one of them. I had a professor. And I was not academic, by the way. Uh, I went to school so I could play baseball. And then all of a sudden, one day, I grew up. And then academics really became important to me. Baseball probably wouldn't have kept me in college. I mean, academics certainly wouldn't. Baseball kept me till I was ready. So I had a professor that was a mentor. So I've had a number of mentors, and all they are, you look at a guy, I look at him, and I go, you know, I like his life. He's, his, prof- his career is very similar to mine. He's respected. He's professional. He's ethical. I, I'd like that guy to be my mentor. Now, you don't go up and say, hey, will you be my mentor? I never told while they were my mentor, my mentors, that they were my mentor. I watched them. I listened to them. I learned from them. I asked them questions. I hung out with them, and I learned. Those are mentors. It's not a formal assignment thing. Uh, I would never walk up to him and say, would you be my mentor? But if I were going to go into the world of startups and everything else, he'd be the mentor. And I would find ways I could sponge the knowledge he has and direction. Or here's a logical question. What's the biggest screw-up you ever did? Inviting you here. No. Thank you. <laughs> Trying to be funny is what it, no. But you learn from that. If, you know, maybe he was asked to invest $250,000 in something. And had he said yes, he'd Uber. be a billion. When I said, I you wasn't going to say, say, it. You I can say gonna it. Say that. Yeah, I'm the guy that said no to Uber. That's okay. See, I wasn't going to say that. <laughs> I wasn't going to throw you under the bus, but you threw yourself under, under the, the Uber bus. car. So the point is, why not have a mentor? My middle son got a PhD in biology, and he went to Costa Rica a number of times. 
once as a student, uh, once surfing up and down Costa Rica, and he would stop at biological reserves and capture baby turtles as they hatched and save them, and they would give him dinner, and he'd sleep on a, a thing outside between trees. And then the third time, he went back as a professor and took students there. Well, one night, my wife and I are watching National Geographic, and it's the reserve that he was staying at. And they're talking about the most dangerous snake in the world. <laughs> it was called the Fair de Lance. And it was called the 100 yard snake, because if it bit you, you died within 100 yards. And my wife's fainting, and I'm going, oh my god, our son's right in the middle of that jungle. And what we learned was they had guides, they had rules. If you didn't have boots on up to your knees, you were sent home. You didn't get a grade drop, you were sent home. They had strict rules, but they had guides that knew how the snakes, in the, and my son had to go out and do tests for his PhD at eight o'clock in the morning, then at noon, four in the afternoon, eight at night, midnight, and four in the morning. You going in that jungle at four in the morning and the deadliest snakes in the world live out there? He needed a mentor, he needed a guide. You're going into that same jungle. How many of you know who Jim Rome is? Jim Rome is one of the biggest names in radio, sports radio. He was one of us. He was my intern, he was a student here. Uh, does anybody know what he calls his show? The Jungle. That's the TV show. It's called, he'll say, Welcome to the Jungle. Now you guys are too young to know this, and we're also very gender sensitive, but husbands used to work and wives would stay at home. Wrong, but that's how it was. And the husband would come home from work and the wife would meet him at the door and say, Hi, honey, how was it today? And he would go, it's a jungle out there. That was the analogy. You're getting ready to compete. When you graduate, I'm gonna shake your hand and say, congratulations, you just finished the easiest part of life. Because <laughs> now you're going out there to compete. And one of my jobs would be, or, or John's jobs, is to get you ready to compete. And if you don't compete, you get trampled. And you get to that third stage of life that I lecture on the circle of life, which is called reflection. And you're sitting in the living room and you're going, this sucks. This is my life and here's where I got. Or you're sitting in that living room and you go, sweet. This turned out really well. Well, you better be able to compete. That doesn't mean you have to be a, a linebacker mentality, but you've got to be ready to compete. And the resume is part of it and mentors are part of it. Etc. Yeah, and I think one of the reasons why, so you guys can tell we're good friends. I don't, I'm not as sarcastic Mediocre, as most but. of my guests. Um, one of the reasons I really wanted you to, you know, we talked about having you come here last year, was that you, you embody that competition and success, but, but you, you're a nice guy. Everybody likes you. You didn't destroy relationships along the way. You didn't feel like you had to destroy other people along the way. You can still win and have a fierce competitive demeanor and be nice and be a nice person and help people um, as well, right? It's not about trashing everybody. Well, I used to lecture on ethics and I would look at my class and I'd say, you're gonna be ethical, but here's what you're doing by being ethical. You're taking one hand and you're tying it behind your back and now you're getting in that ring and you're climbing in that ring with Mike Tyson. You're at a disadvantage if you're ethical but being unethical has so many negative things evolve over your life. Cheat on your wife. Hey, that'd be fun. Or husband. Or husband. Uh, see, gender insensitive. Um, you want to look at your sons who love that woman more than life themselves and tell them you just crushed her? There's your ethics. On and on and on. Business. You're going to do business with that, with that snake? See, your name is a word in the dictionary. You, look, you open the dictionary, which we don't use anymore. You open the dictionary and you look at the word chair. A piece of furniture made for the human anatomy out of various elements, wood, whatever, metal, for the human body to sit in. Noun. Okay. Your name is a word in the dictionary. What's your name? Connor. Connor? No. 
So I'm going to Isla Vista and I'm going to go study with seven of my classmates or I'm going to a meeting with my colleagues and Connor's colleagues. On the way over, as I, get, I see Connor and I go to my meeting or my study session, I say, hey, I just saw Connor. The next sentence is your definition in the dictionary. Somebody goes, that guy's a stinking snake. I wouldn't trust him as far as I could throw him. I was in a group project with him. He did nothing. And he backed my, he knifed my buddy in the back on this situation. The guy's a slime ball. Or I walk in and they, I said, I just saw Connor. The guy's a stud. I love that guy. He was in two of my classes. And uh, I got, my mother got sick. And we were doing a project. And he said, you go. I'll pick you up. I'll get it done. He's one of the most ethical people I've ever known. So here's my question. Five years from now, what's the definition going to be when your name is said? Anybody going to want to do business with you? I know what his, def his reputation is, and it's really, really good. And people want to be around him. They want to work with him, etc. Well, that just doesn't happen. It takes work. So you're going to be ethical, but you're at a disadvantage. And that's kind of where the art of war comes in. Which yeah, I we'll talk about that in a second. But I, 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 I somewhat disagree with you in the sense that I've always felt like being honest is a competitive advantage because of the reason you just mentioned that people will want to work with you. And I try to pick and choose what rings I get in. Like, I wouldn't get in the ring knowingly with an unethical, dishonest person. Sure. I just wouldn't do it. If that's the game they play, let them go play it with somebody else. I, I want to think that I'm working with honest people. And I'm not always right about that. But I feel like it's over time, and especially if you want to be a serial entrepreneur, if you want to be someone who's successful more than once, some people can get lucky, be super unethical and get lucky once. But it's tough to get lucky over and over again if you're, if you're dishonest, right? Because you're, not gonna, you're gonna end up surrounding yourself with other dishonest, unethical people. Yeah, you and can't, bad things can't happen. do that. He talked about a ring. He, does, he selects what ring he goes into. Well, if we go to my career as a college coach, you don't pick the ring. Right. I'm going against that team and that guy cheats like a bandit. Mm. And he'll lie to players to get them into school. He'll take scholarships away from them if they don't perform at a decent level, even though it was his mistake to recruit the kid. Uh, he'll cheat on scholarship or, or uh, fundraising. Well, you got to coach against that guy. Mm -hmm. Here, you know what this is? He won't let me use a whiteboard here. I could educate you nine times more than <laughs> you're going to be educated tonight if he let me use a whiteboard. Nope. That is the playing field. It is not a level playing field. You're all going out. See this guy right here? His dad was a billionaire. At his 16th birthday, what kind of car do you want? What kind of cars do you want? <laughs> oh, you want to go into business? Here's a 50 million startup and I'll put you together with all my colleagues. This guy didn't grow up with a silver spoon in his mouth. This guy's worked his tail off every day of his life and had to borrow three jobs, save money, work. Now they're both going into the same career. It's not a level playing field. That doesn't mean he's going to lose. He's just got to be smarter, more dedicated, more organized, more tenacious, that's how you win. But he's got to be ready to compete. You can't sit there and go, well, they got that, and I didn't get that. When I coached, I really respected some of the people I coached against. Tremendous people. And there were some snakes. You, you got two choices. You either outsmart them, outwork them, out everything else them, or you become out unethical to straighten out the playing field. But that choice really doesn't work. Like, and you can have short-term gains, but I think in the end, we all know it doesn't work. So I've had so many people up on the stage over the years, and the one commonality, I think, of their success was they outworked their competition. They outworked their, their peers at their company and their competition in, in, in general. Very few people just get, get it on raw talent, raw energy, raw intelligence. It's working really hard. So I'm going to go to the first student question in one second. So if you, if you could be ready with the mic. So let's talk about The Art of War. Um, I know it's a book you like. Um, I've used it in some of my classes, as well as The Art of Woo, which is, a, which is another book similar to it. 
what are some specific examples from that book that you used in coaching and, and you know, just in your teaching sure. career? Well, I was in a conflict, and it was an ethical conflict. And a buddy of mine came up to me, and I can say buddy, but he was in a successful level in the world you perceive and he's involved in that was ridiculous. Forbes list. And when I was in the middle of this conflict, he came up and put an arm around me, and he's a year and a half younger than me, so I, he goes, you are so stinking naive. I want you to read this book, and the book was that big, I've never forgotten it. It was The Art of War by Sun Tzu, spelled S-U-N like Sun, and Tzu, T-Z-U. So I start reading it. Now, if my sons would have given it to me or my wife, and you know how much I think of them, I would have lasted about four paragraphs and chucked it. I could understand what it was talking about war, but how does this apply to my life? How can he tell me I'm naive because I don't understand what I'm reading here? So I finished it, only because he gave it to me. Then I found another copy. If you go to a bookstore, and I know they're dying too, if you went to war, <laughs> the war area, Art of War's there. If you go to history, Art of War. If you go to business, Art of War. If you go to strategy, Art of War. That book is every place. It's 2,000 years old. So I got a copy, and I read it, and I highlighted it. Then I read it again, and I highlighted it. And I know you think I'm Phi Beta Kappa because of the way I handle myself. <laughs> I did the Jackie Robinson story for a book report 12 times. It's the only, <laughs> book, only book I'd ever read. Not Phi Beta Kappa, but this thing. That guy gave it to me, and I'm going to understand this sucker. So then the next time, highlight and notes, and then highlight and notes. And then I would take those highlighted copies with notes, and I gave them to each of my sons. And I said, someday I'm going to explain this to you. I felt I knew it so well, which was like 70%, that I started lecturing on it in the department. I'd spend about four days. And I made them read the book first. And that was done by intimidation and fear. You're going to read that sucker. <laughs> and don't fake like you're not, because I'm going to pick you the first day of class for sure. Well, they never knew who would be picked. Why was I such a hard nose? They needed to read it for this to work. They needed not to understand it. So I'm just going to give you a couple of things out of it. Uh, the battle is won before it's fought. What does that mean? A good friend of mine was called into a very powerful man's office about a week ago. And he was honored by being asked some of the toughest questions in that organization. And he sat there, and this guy's here, and he's here in power. And he started answering them. And it flowed. And the guy who was tough to connect with looked at them when they were done and said, I really appreciate what you've given me, the knowledge you've given me. My door is open to you. Well, his door isn't open to anybody. And I said, how nervous were you? Did you need a facility when he asked you to come in the office? He said, no. He said, I've kind of thought about this for over a year. What if? And so he would have a long drive to commute, and he would play the scenario through his head. You know what he did? He prepared for that moment in time 50 times. And when this very intimidating moment came, he nailed it. He was ready. He, that wasn't won the day of the meeting. That was won before the battle was fought. So why were my teams so successful? People couldn't figure it out. We're an academic school. I had to compete against Cal State Fullerton, uh, a number of schools. I'm not going to go through all the schools. Stanford North. But they could get a lot of people in. And their facilities, ours was a high school F facility when I got here. Right now, that baseball facility is a Division I C, C minus. So you're recruiting a kid, and he sees a $59 million facility at LSU, and he comes and visits here, and I take him to the Beachside Restaurant with all the young ladies studying for spring break with my back to the beach. So he's looking over my shoulder. And on his way home, he goes, you know, we never saw the field. Well, that wasn't a mistake. <laughs> that was recruiting. So 
the battle was won because our practices were so organized, so intense, so much tougher than the game that when, I'll never forget the first time I coached against USC, they were very arrogant. And they came walking in and they said, we've seen the JV diamond, where's the varsity diamond? <laughs> and I, there were some words I wanted to say, but I said to my players, we don't do that. We play the game, we analyze what's going on, we don't get in the ragging contest, which is what it's called. They had a pitcher, his name was Randy Johnson. Six foot 10, he threw 100 miles an hour and is in the Hall of Fame and is the second Second most successful strikeout pitcher, I think, of all time behind Nolan Ryan. They had a first baseman named Mark McGuire. Mark McGuire hit 70 home runs in a season. Might have used some Asterix. Help. Asterix. <laughs> <laughs> and we beat them in the ninth inning, two to one. Later, and it was actually later they made their statement about the JV diamond. We beat them about 14 to three. And I turned to the players and I said, I've never let you rag, and I'm never gonna let you rag again. But you've earned this moment in time. <laughs> and I, I had to tell them what to say because they were so inexperienced at ragging. They would have, their rag would have been, oh yeah? You know, it would have been something like that. <laughs> Says who? <laughs> so their rag over to the other team was, we've seen the JV team, when are you bringing the varsity team? They were bitter, and they didn't say a word, and they dropped their heads, and they walked off and went in the bus and went home. There was a great lesson. The playing field was like this. This is USC. Those guys all had ascots and cigarette holders. <laughs> They're money people. They had scholarships. They had stadium. We didn't, and I drove that into the players' heads. When they walked out on that field, I said, these guys are laughing at you. They're looking down at you. We're gonna take this game and shove it down their throat. But you gotta be focused, you gotta be intense, you gotta be disciplined. There was a lot of reward for that. And uh, those were some of the ways, and that's the art of war. It was one before the battle was. Yeah. Keep your friends closer. I mean, excuse me, keep your friends close, but keep your enemies closer. That's the art of war, it's a very common sen uh, statement. Here's something, and President Trump won the election. Probably didn't know that. <laughs> there were a lot of leaks in the White House. They had to track down the leaks. Now they had a lot of people from the previous administration, so that was kind of an Achilles heel. And I thought to myself, basic art of war, and they can solve this. And here's what basic art of war would be. I tell her that one plus one is three. Now, not really the numbers, but I give her information that's wrong. And I tell him one plus one is four, one plus one is five, one plus one is six, one plus one is seven. Now, they're all wrong. Now, all of a sudden, CNN breaks with a huge story. CNN is five. One, two, three. He's the guy. There's my spy. It's false information. Intentionally leaked to potential leakers to identify him. That's an art of war, that's 2,000 years old. And this very powerful person I told you about that's a, a friend, he's the one that said, you know what, the business world, most of the world is based on the art of war. I've watched movies, a very, very high level movie, Dumb and Dumber, mm. it's based on the art of war. The Godfather, the art of war. Wall Street, the art of war. I, I met with a, a director one day on a flight back from spring training. And I said, tell me if I'm wrong. Is every movie, the skeleton is the art of war, and then you put meat on it. And if it's funny meat, it's a dumb and dumber. And if it's serious meat, it's a drama. And he goes, you know, I never thought of it that way, but it kind of is. The art of war is every place. It's hard to understand, um, but I loved teaching it. And I didn't even know what the art of war was when he put his arm around me and handed me that book. Excellent. Yeah. Let's take the, actually we'll take a couple students' questions in a row. Um, so this was based off the description on Gaucho Space, but my question was, what would you say is the key to good fundraising and how do you appeal to people or organizations to make them donate? So just to give some context to not everyone that didn't have the access to the syllabus, um, amongst Al's many accomplishments is he raised a lot of money for the baseball program and the sports program in general over $600,000. So in the context of all that fundraising you did, 
Okay, if you said, what is your Achilles heel in coaching? I'd say fundraising. We have a baseball coach here now that's a very good friend of mine, and he's a very good coach. And we're all competitive, so if he and I went out and had a non-alcoholic cabassier, because I don't drink, uh, I'd say, uh, how do you grade yourself as a hitting coach? And he'd give himself a grade, and I'd give me a grade. How about as a strategy guy? Grade, grade. Practice organization, recruiting, da 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 We get to fundraising, I'd go, I'm an F, you're an A. I do not like asking for anything. That's a flaw for me. And if I was building a baseball stadium, which we were, we were trying to go from that high school F to a Division I C, it was hard. I'd sit down with people and I'd try to explain what we were gonna do and how it would benefit the community. And you've seen all the success we've had. We're in the newspapers, we're on television. The program deserves this. God, it was hard for me. I'd go home and I'd go, I stink. And I expected to go one for one, two for two, three for three, four for four. And my oldest son, who's kind of in that world of business, said, Dad, you go one for three. You're going nuts. So back off on yourself. So to answer your question, one, I hated it. Two, what success we had, and it's modest success, to be honest with you. There's schools raising tens of millions of dollars for the facilities. We had a lot of success. And how many of you are familiar with the term bandwagon? Yeah, everybody in here is a Warriors fan right now. <laughs> yeah, hey, bandwagon, <laughs> yeah, we won the champ. We, I hate that. We won the championship. All week I had guys, yeah, hey, we the Dodgers, we're gonna win, we're in the World Series, we, we, we. The next week I'm hearing them, 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 because they didn't win. So the bandwagon thing, we're all over the place. We're beating Texas, at Texas. That had never happened, not by us, by anybody. We beat Stanford. Stanford had won the national title. We won five out of six. We go to Arizona State. They got outfielders. You won't know two of them, but the other one was Barry Bonds. All three of them were major leaguers. We took five out of six. Everybody, what's going on? Well, the bandwagon was going on. Get on the bandwagon and give me some money. <laughs> Obviously, I didn't approach it that way. So you've asked me the wrong question. For me. Well, let me ask you this. What would you have done differently now that you have all this time? Would you have hired someone else yes. that was better? Oh, God, yes. But we had no money to you hire You would have hired anybody. Connor, and he would have been out there raising money for you. Or... Connor, I'll give you 30%. <laughs> um, yeah, you know what? And you know what? A coach shouldn't be fundraising. We have a, de a department here called development. That's their job. Right. Fund the athletic department. When I got here, we had 2.8 scholarships. Do you know what my competition had? 13. I can name some major league superstars. Uh, you, all of you wouldn't know, but a handful. Robin Ventura, who's big. I'm a guy named Mark Grace, marginal Hall of Fame kind of guy. And uh, a guy named Billy Bean, who is in charge of diversity now for Major League Baseball. He was the first player to come out as gay. He ended up going to Loyola Marymount because they offered him a full ride, and I had like a, a quarter of a ride. His first major league game, he gets five hits. Nobody ever did that. All three of those guys were coming here to play for me. And all three of them called me and said, Coach, San Diego State, the other one was Oklahoma State, the other one was Loyola, they offered me a full ride. If you can match it, I'm still coming. I don't have that. You know what our team finished that year in the nation? Fifth. Out of 320 Division I teams, we finished fifth in the nation, and we had those three guys walk away from us. Not because we didn't have some pot of gold, because we were not funded at the minimum. And eventually we got up to 6.8 scholarships from fundraising, and I think now they're at 11.8, and the NC2A brought scholarships down to 11.8, so they can compete mm -hmm. there. But we lost players left and right because of that. So yeah, there are people who are responsible for that and they dropped the ball. And I tried to pick it up and I wasn't very good at picking it up. Let's take the next student question then I'm gonna ask you a little bit about some of those players you recruited. How important was networking as a coach to you becoming like an entrepreneur or just like your success as an entrepreneur? First of all, you're wearing a Cub shirt, right? Just the city of Chicago. Oh, so you're representing the city, not the team. Yeah. Okay, I got you. He basically said how important is networking, and he was more specific with things. But let me tell you, you have three tools to be successful. 
And I'm going to give you those three tools right now. There's, there's tangent tools. Your native intelligence, your environment, there's some things that will help you. Uh, do you know the word gin? Any of you know about gin? Yeah, G-I-N. G is graduate school. That's the least valuable of the three things we're going to talk about, unless you're a doctor, a lawyer, something where you have to go to graduate school. Um, in sport management, you don't need to go to graduate school. Uh, if you had an idea and you had mentors and things took off as a venture capitalist and you had a gift, you don't need graduate school. At least that's my humble opinion, and he may disagree with no, that. No, I totally agree. Okay. You do not need it. The I in the word gin is internships which is more encompassing than just internships. If, I, if John came up to me and said, I've got a starting job at $100,000, which I think is still a good salary for yeah, a starting okay. job, and you need to pick somebody out of this class, and I'll give it to him. Who do I pick? Now, every one of you sits there and goes, yo, me. But I don't get to go, yo, me. I go, yo, look at all these people. So I want you to interact a little bit here. How are we doing timeologically? I've got the time covered. Good. Don't worry about it. Okay. You're the We're guy. out of time. Anyway. No, I'm kidding. You had to teach him how to clap, so I was worried. <laughs> All right. Um, how many of you, I'll ask a couple of questions I used to ask all my class. I want you to raise your hands high only because I need to see a number. How many of you slam dunk, flat out, know what you're going to do for a career right now? Look at that. We're talking maybe 10, and there's like 3,000 of you in here. <laughs> Here's why I do that. You're normal. Do not worry about it. You're getting educated. Remember, not theory, although that's some of it. You're learning stuff. You're going to go out, and it's going to be a smorgasbord, and you're going to get a job in that company, and you're going to learn some stuff, and you're going to learn some stuff you think is stupid and some things that are great, and now you're going to go over and try that career, a little bit, that looks good. And now pretty soon it's gonna come into focus and you're gonna need every skill you have. So internships and entry level jobs, that's an impressive growing time. Another thing that comes out of the internship is you're on stage. I used to quote Shakespeare, which is humorous because there's no Shakespeare in Jackie Robinson's life story. <laughs> but I would quote it to my class, life is but a stage and we're all actors on that stage. Every day, people are watching you. You know when you're in a gutter in Isla Vista puking your guts out? <laughs> people are watching, and I know your roomie goes, hey, that was hilarious the other night. Yeah, well, it's hilarious at 18 or 20, but now I gotta uh, hire somebody to go into my career in uh, venture capital with a big project. Am I gonna hire that guy? I like him, he's a good guy. Space cadet. Can't depend on them. People are watching all the time. And yet somebody's going, you know what? I like her. She's got everything I'm looking for in a, a coworker. And all of a sudden you get a job. You were on the stage, you were an actor, and the audience was watching you and liked what they saw. So that goes with the Shakespeare thing. I had another unbelievably important piece of knowledge coming off of that and I forgot it, but that's I, okay. But I've got a question for you. I haven't even got to so end. N's the best letter in the net, gin. Oh, I thought you were done. No. What's, what's N? Networking. N, N is networking, ethical networking. Uh, you do, and this has been my philosophy. If I could do something for every person in here in, in our two semesters together, if we had it, I'd do it. If, if, if he worked hard for me and stuff and he said, hey, my aunt is coming in from New York and she's the biggest Yankee fan in the world and they're playing Oakland A's. Is there any way I could get her in that ballpark? And I'd say, yeah, one of my guys works in media relations. You've been a good person. I'd like to help you. I call him and say, hey, a guy's got his mom coming in or whatever. She'd love to see a game. Can we do something? Now, they want to give back to me because I helped them when they were here and they go, sure. People relationships. So if I did something, think of this. We're guesstimating 250 people. If I did 250 things here, I'm not doing it because I'm going, you know what, that guy's going to be the head of uh, Apple someday, and I could get a lot of money out of it. You don't do it for those reasons. 
You do it because it's the right thing to do and you're capable of doing it. Now, four years from now, I really like and respect him. But there was a cutback at his company. He's out of work. He's got three children and a wife and he's screwed. And this guy's big time. Because I did something for him many years ago or whatever, I feel very comfortable. Remember I couldn't ask money when I fundraised? I, can, I didn't like doing that. I don't mind doing this. I go to him, hey, how you hanging? Yeah, I saw the stock market, nice job. I got a guy who's very deserving. He just got blindsided in a career. I will take my reputation and put it on his shoulders. You're not gonna do better than him. I'd appreciate it if you give him a chance. He wants to give him a chance. He wants to pay back. Now, he might not be able to, and if he says, geez, we've just finished with all our hirings. Okay, you got a big network, you got anybody? Yeah, let me make some phone calls. That's how it works. I've never gotten a job from a want ad. I've gotten them from people. You've got to start connecting. The other part of your resume, we talked about what's the best thing on your resume. How about your references? Blow me away with a name on your references. And you might be the person I picked for his $100,000 job. There's three ways to blow people away with your references. One is the name. Watch this, this is a setup. Does anybody here, you've got on your resume, Alicia Moore. Who knows who Alicia Moore is? Nobody? Who's Alicia Moore? Pink. pink. You know Pink, climbing ropes, greatest singer in the world maybe? Pink. She lives in the San Inez Valley. So if his resume says Joe Smith, Mary Smith, uh, Associate Dean, Pink! He's got an interview. The interview might be this stupid. Hey, what's Pink like? <laughs> She's my favorite performer. So there's the power of a name, okay? Steve Jobs. It's a little late for that reference, but <laughs> Steve Jobs. Put it I'd, down, you'll get away with it. I'd like to know about Steve. You worked with Jobs? Come on in, I wanna, you, you've got an interview. So it's the power of the name. The next one is the power of the position. Secretary of State, uh, general manager of the Dodgers. I might not even know that, that name might be Joe Smith, but holy crime, he's got the general manager of the Dodgers on his references. So that's the power of the position. The other one is the power of a relationship. If I'm gonna have, I have all your resumes and one of them says uh, John Greathouse. I go, what? I know John. We got a relation, I, let me call John. John, tell me about this guy. It's a personal thing. It's not the title of the position. He's not, certainly not pink. Nope. But I know him. Now, I'm gonna tell you a rule that counseling screws you over. The counseling department here. <laughs> Your resume. Two things. How many pages is it? One. That's wrong. It's one if the company asks you for one. Then it's one. But what if you cured cancer and you're going, uh, That'll go over on the second page, so I'll leave that off. How many pages should his and my resume be? If mine was one, I shouldn't be interviewed. What have you been doing all your life? But if they ask for one, then it's gotta be one. The other thing they screw you up with is references upon request. Be honest with me. Raise your hand if you have references upon request. Raise them. Oh yeah, you stinking liars, raise them. Okay. Now. I've got 100 resumes to go through. My son just did this with the Pittsburgh Pirates a couple years ago. He called me, he goes, Dad, I get to hire three people here with the Pirates. They gave me 100 resumes, this is gonna take forever. I said, okay, if you see the word two, T-O-O -O on there, and an O is crossed out, anything like that, throw it away. So now he's down to 95 resumes. Then I go, if they ask for three letters, and anybody sent two, throw those away. So now you're down to 60. Now the greatest human in the world could be in those getting thrown away. And then he gets down to him and he goes, what about references upon request? Throw them away. Here's why. This guy looks pretty good. But now I gotta contact him. He's gotta contact his references. Then he's gotta get them back to me and then I gotta con, I don't have time. The world is a very fast place. Put the stinking references on, at the bottom of the resume. And the other thing is, he knows John Greathouse. 
but I don't know he knows them because he doesn't have his references there. Or he knows pink. How do I know? It's no references. Those are simple things that could cost you interviews. You need to know how the game's played, and it's nothing more than a game. <coughs> Sir? So we have about five minutes for one more question. I want you to, and this is going to be hard to do in five minutes. You want the meaning of life? Yes. We already got that. No, you um, didn't. And we got it on film. Let's talk about the movie. So the backstory could take a long time. So quick on the backstory and more on okay. really why you think it's an important message to get out there. It's a true story, number one. I was online and I saw a video. The video was a couple of minutes. And I thought, why isn't this a movie? They should all watch the video, by the way. Yeah. And I'll give you the link. So I cold call. I knew the guy the movie was about, or the video. It wasn't a movie. Just his video. I know that guy. He went to UCSB one year. So I cold called him. I said, John, you don't know me. My name's Al Ferrari. He goes, Coach, I know you. I roomed with some of your players when I was at UCSB. I said, why isn't this a stinking movie? And he goes, well, Disney bought the rights to it. And they paid me six figures. And they had a, not six for him, but they paid six figures for a script and for the whole thing. And he said a guy dropped dead for Disney. He was 36 years old. And it's sitting on a shelf, and it'll never be made now. I said, okay, we're going to make this. The only thing I knew about movies is you buy a ticket to go in. I knew nothing, and I'm telling him we're going to make it. But one of my baseball players, who is part of my network, I called him. He's done, now he's done 70 movies as an assistant director, as an actor, and other things. You've heard of every movie he's done. The Bourne movies, Fast and Furious, Blindside, Sideways. You kidding me? So we all go to lunch, and I say, Nick, let's make a movie. He thought I was nuts. <laughs> I introduced him to John, whose name is John Barnes. I showed him a video. I said, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen. And people tried to say, well, it's like Rudy, or it's like Blindside, and I said, no. It's the King's Speech, which one movie of the year that year. Here's why. This kid, John Barnes, from the age of seven to the age of 22, got the crap kicked out of him every day, mentally, physically. He had three learning disabilities. Couldn't read, uh, got kicked out of class, held back. He went to 10 schools, but he had a goal. He wanted to be a quarterback. You can't be a quarterback. How do you understand the plays? How do you read them, etc.? He never quit. At age 22, he went to five universities. One was UCSB. He had a great year. They dropped the program. It's the first time he'd ever had success. He would cry at night with his mom because he saw this was his life. He goes to UCLA, he begs them to let him walk on. They said no, they said no. Finally, they got pressured in and they took him to be the fifth string quarterback. He and I are gonna win the lottery twice tomorrow before five quarterback, four quarterbacks get hurt. And that's what happened. Last game of the year, USC, UCLA, in the Rose Bowl, national television, and he's named the quarterback. The headlines in the LA Times said, John who? The next one is, uh, Terry Donahue and his staff to be fired because they're going to finish under 500. And the only thing to keep all of them from being fired is John Barnes, learning disabilities and bullied. So I've become a tremendous advocate for kids that are bullied. I never understood it when I was younger. Learning disabilities, I wish I could start my teaching and coaching career over again because I never understood it. And you know what? Here's what I found out from dealing with worldwide experts. Here's the learning disabled, the people that are dyslexic, the people that have all those things. Here's the rest of us. We haven't caught up to them. That's what it is. But because they're outside the norm, they get picked on or they get left behind, that's a crock. So my goal in making this movie is to have John Barnes become the patron saint of every kid that's ever had a learning dis disability or been bullied. And John is now 44, lives in the Silicon Valley, two children, great wife, makes four times the money I make, and is very happy. Google John Barnes, that's Barnes with an E, 1992, USC, UCLA. When we get the actors there, that will be the highlight of the movie, and that's the actual footage of what happened.
So tell them what the announcer, like this is the real announcer, what does he say at the very I've very even end? met with the guy who did this game in 1992, and his last sentence is, 20 years from now, all of us are going to be going to theaters around the world to see the John Barnes story of what happened tonight. Well, I'm running out of time. And we've raised $20 million four times. And one guy, as I said, died. One got a divorce the day after he committed. Things have happened. And I'm getting ready to pick myself up off the ground and go again. Do I have one minute? One minute. It's only the meaning of life. <laughs> okay. Write this down. And get off your uh, poker site and, <laughs> and, and type it in. Life, I climbed uh, Mount Everest. Took me a couple of hours, and I got to the top. And sitting there in that yogi position, stinking Dalai Lama's sitting there. So I get up there and I go, yo, Dalai, how about a little something for the effort? I just climbed this. What's the meaning of life? And the Dalai looks at me and he goes, my son, life is a kickoff return. Write that down. I'm not just screwing around. What do I mean life's a kickoff return? You started a goal. Might be birth, might be the start of your startup. You start there. You're going to that goal. There's a whole bunch of people don't want you to get there. Almost nobody returns the kickoff without getting touched. And if they return 10 kickoffs, at some point, am I allowed to say ass? No. Okay. You're going to get knocked on your ass. It's going to happen. That's life. Every one of you in here is going to get knocked on your ass. Now, why do I tell you that? To make you feel bad? No. It's kind of like the art of war. I want you to see that that's normal. It's going to happen. I don't want it to be cancer of a loved one. I don't want it to be that kind of knocked on your butt because that one's tough. I want it to be you get fired in your job. I want it to be your second startup's a huge failure. You can get away with that. That's just career. That's not family and love and stuff. Deal with it. Here's what defines you, and this is a line in uh, Wall Street One. The hero's walking into the office, and the police are waiting in his office because he's been doing insider trading. He doesn't know his life is about to be turned upside down. And his mentor walks out to him and says, Bud, sometimes men look into the abyss, big hole, dark. And how they react to that defines them as a man. When you get knocked on your butt, you're not wanna, you don't want to get up. You want to lay in bed. You don't want to face it. You've got to say, screw it. This is when we get tough. This is when we compete. I'm not staying down. I'm getting after it. And you're going to come. That's going to define you as a person, how you do that. And then you get on with life and things happen. But please know, someday you're going to be... 34 years old, and you're going to get knocked on your ass, and you're going to go, okay, this sucks and it hurts. I don't want to get up, but Ferrer told me this was going to happen. And this is okay. It's normal. Now let's get on with it. So that's straight from the stinking Dalai Lama. You guys learned that. And you had to climb Everest to get that, and we got that for free. Yeah, and it took me two hours. <laughs> so. Al, thank okay, you. Okay, just, but, I've never been to Everest. I've barely been to, like, Tahoe, okay? <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> Thank you.